If we are to believe one of the biggest claims in golf, then surely this very expensive, very worn wedge shouldn't be able to do, well, that. I mean, that is obscene amount of spin. However, whilst debunking the myth for the average golfer, I have four exotic wedges that don't do that well in the second-hand market because I want to give you valid reasons to change your wedges on a budget and it's not gonna revolve around new grooves. Now, if you type in a simple phrase into Google, how often should I be changing my wedges? It varies from 65 rounds all the way up to a very generous 100. And for me, those stats are so wildly generic that there's a lot of variables that have been conveniently left out. But because this part of the game is so important, which I completely agree with, I feel like we blindly agree with it because this part of the game has so many variables, where do you begin to question it? Until today, which we're gonna question the four different variables. And I think so crucial when it comes to wedges, not only do I need to change them, but more do I have the correct head for my game. But first, let's talk about the merits of these claims and what grooves actually do and who sharper grooves actually benefit more. I have a lovely little Cleveland RTX 3 wedge here, which again, could be wrong for some of you out here as we go through the video. But the sole purpose of grooves is to channel away like dirt, debris, water, away from the ball when it makes contact with the wedge. Plus an added bonus of friction, but then that's when golf balls become very important in this equation as well. Dry 52 degree Cleveland wedge here. The best part of 40 pounds second hand. Nice bit of stopping power, 11,000 worth of backspin. 52 degrees that is. But I haven't added in the rough, the dirt on an actual golf course, and I haven't added in a poor technique, which would definitely affect those numbers as well. But it's the whole reason back in 2009, wedge grooves were limited in terms of depth and width. But I want you to see this statement here when the rules were introduced, it was specifically to affect the pros more, bombing driver down there not worrying where it goes and still getting enough spin out of the rough on those very firm and fast greens for the rest of us and in that statement it wasn't really to affect a lot of amateur golfers yet over the last decade we're told change your wedges every two years no matter your technique no matter your club head speed no matter your ball striking and everything else we're about to talk about so let's start with the first variable and my first exotic wedge that i have in my hand here and finish with the rather worn expensive one I have down there, which I actually quite like. One of the first reasons we're told to upgrade our wedges is so that they're wide enough, sharp enough, that the ball doesn't ride up the face. And the higher the shot off the face with your wedge, the higher the launch, but lower the spin. The lower it is, the lower the launch, the higher the spin. However, I say this time and time again to a lot of my lessons, these clubs, or let's say you're pitching wedge out of your iron set when you first pick up the game, one of the easiest clubs to master because it's the first one in your bag that you can consistently get up in the air. However, for some of you veterans watching this video, hopefully you'll agree with me, this is one of the hardest clubs in our game to master. I'll show you this nice little graphic on screen here where a strike location of a wedge should be. And when we start this game, because it goes up in the air, we feel, oh, that is a success. However, when you're dropping your handicap and you're looking to increase spin with your wedges, strike location is so important. And on the Hummer, but more specifically this RTX 3, you can see how high already those strikes are. Even towards the hill, that's almost shank territory. My point is we're told to upgrade our wedges so that the ball doesn't ride up the face. Well, the grooves on this RTX 3 wedge are basically brand new. Same with the Hummer. That is purely down to technique and technique alone. Variable two, which coincidentally left out, is angler attack. How much divot are you really making after that golf ball? And this one hits very close to home, as I've got a stag do 
golf one shows my age <laughs> at the end of September. And the one part of my game I need to work on a lot is my wedge play. And because I've built my channel over the last three years of hitting the ball incredibly far, that means I come very into out, very flippy, very much up on the golf ball. Therefore, old technique with this Betanardi wedge. No divot whatsoever. Very prone to thinning it straight out the back, but more importantly, no backspin whatsoever. The upside of that technique is that my wedges lasted a lifetime because guess what? No grass or dirt ever touched the thing just like this Betanardi here. I mean, the person's barely used it. Okay, that's very much an exaggeration of in to out, I must say, and obviously up into the ball. But to prove my point again, 90 miles an hour with the same wedge. All right, no pressure, Simon. This is what you've been practicing for. Stag do in less than a month. Oh, he loves it. He absolutely loves it. 90 miles an hour. Go on, zip back. Oh. More spin, down, neutral. The downside is if I played 100 rounds of golf and practiced a lot off grass, with variable one and variable two, i.e. strike location there, always middled, hitting down into the turf, debris, stone, flint, you name it. Well then yes, I do think that I'd probably need to change my wedge after a hundred odd rounds. Which brings me on to wedge number three and variable number three. Do you guys really need any more spin into the green or do you just need, well, let's be honest, some pretty decent forgiveness? Now we're certainly not going to talk too much about technique and certainly not going to talk about wedge fitting because that can be a wormhole. However, if you do have this high ball location off your wedges, you see this riding up of all the flint and the stone or whatever coming up half the face, you get these high floaty ones that I'll show you in a minute and they go nowhere. Bigger bounce, chunkier will help give you more distance and not necessarily more spin, but there is definitely a fine line when it comes to amateur golf. Obviously this is a 56, not a 58 like the Mizuno I have in a minute, but it kind of proves my point. No bounce, very easy to go underneath it, start of all. And if that is one of your issues, get something chunkier like this. I'll pop up some other wedges that are thick and chunky like this as well, because the Mizuno only goes up to 54 degrees, well, 54 to 60 degrees, I should say, in lofts. However, there's a fine line. I said at the start, mastering these can be incredibly tough. And your pitching wedge of nine iron go 100 yards, 120 yards, and your 56 or even 52, go absolutely nowhere. Because our face is too open at the top, which works well for our irons, and then we hit up on it because we're scooping, or let's be honest, just hit the ground, stood up, coming across it, spin comes down, 80 yards. 79 miles an hour. My point is these heads here are designed for good shot. Low flight, loads of speed. You've got the club at speed, you've got the yardages. However, this is designed for the bad shots and we have to be honest with ourselves. Wet, soggy lies in the winter, how confident are we? How often do we hit the middle of the face? Do we hit it high up here? And let's be honest, if we do have an astronomical amount of spin on our wedge, it's not gonna go any further. And if you've got a massive gap between your pitching wedge and your iron set, cavity back, and then your 50 or 52 degree wedge, either get a gap wedge in the iron set or sand wedge if it comes in it, or get a chunky wedge set at the bottom. I appreciate these only go to 54 degrees. But depending on your club head speed, that's probably all you might require. Which brings me on to variable number four, very worn. Probably the biggest reason, and one of the variables that we'd probably say has the most weight to it in terms of the claim. No wonder this person that did once spend near on 300 pounds with this wedge decide, okay, maybe it's time to get rid. And I know they could get lots of spin and low flight from their wedge, because look where the wear pattern is, very low, almost too low, you could say, off this wedge. I.e., if you're catching the ball off the first two grooves, you're probably getting too much dirt and debris in between the ball, even with the excellent grooves, the 300 pound grooves that you have there. And again, it just emphasizes how important technique is when it comes to this part of the game. Pulled it a touch. However, with this very burnt out, destroyed groove machine, 
we can still get ample amount of spin, which would definitely stop on a green. However, it is dry in here. I'm not hitting it out the rough. That's more like it. And that's where you're gonna see the biggest signs of drop off in spin. That's what grooves are great for. If you find the fairway 100% of the time, play with whatever wedge you like. Oh, I did get 11,400 with this wedge. My point is a tour professional that has all four variables locked down, strike location, technique, finding those grooves. Of course, they're gonna wear through wedges within 100 rounds, 80 rounds, probably more like 50 rounds. But for a lot of us amateurs that probably only have one variable locked down, I wouldn't be too concerned if your wedge is starting to look a bit tatty. And let's be honest, it's taken a lot of work, a lot of balls, a lot of practice to get that kind of wear on a wedge, which honestly would make me happy because it means you're grinding on one of the most important parts of this game. Guys, if you've got any questions on your equipment or your golf game, sasgolfacademy.com. Catch you guys later.